Hi everybody, and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. Now last week we talked about what was the original Passover. We went back to Exodus and we really looked at what that original time, um, what, what was involved in it, and um, we've, I think, been able to see that the timing of Jesus' crucifixion was very significant because it was during the time of Passover. And the blood that was shed way back in Exodus from that little lamb or the little goat that they, that they did as a sacrifice on that night, when that blood was put above their doors and around on the sides of their doors, they were protected then. They didn't come under the judgment because the blood had been shed and the, the angel passed over them. Well, Jesus would become the final, most incredible, necessary, sacrificial lamb when he's crucified. The final one that would ever be needed. And his blood would be the redemption forever. And so the timing of the Passover was very, very important. Now we're going to go once again, um, as we shared last week, we're going to go once again into Luke 22, 7 through 23. So now, as we look at the meal that is often called the Last Supper, we have to realize this was a Passover meal that Jesus was having with his disciples. This Thursday was the beginning of Passover. And this, um, this meal now, um, Jesus wants us to remember him. And he was the culmination. He was the real fulfillment of what the Passover had meant for all of these years that now the forgiveness would be there because of the blood of the Lamb. If I look at a note in my New Living Translation, this is in reference to um, Matthew 26, and um, it's in verses like 17 through 35, where we have this basically the same account. But this note says, On Thursday evening, Jesus observes a Passover meal with his disciples. The next day, he would accomplish the redemption which Passover foreshadowed. Henceforth, the Lord's Supper would replace the Passover feast as a commemoration of an even greater deliverance. And I, I just thought that was said so well there. I think it would be good for us to go ahead now and just read again Luke 22, 7 through 23. And that's the main thing we'll really be discussing this time. Now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, Go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Where do you want us to prepare it? they asked him. He replied, As soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. Then they went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. When the time came, Jesus and the, then Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. But here at this table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. For it has been determined that the Son of Man must die. But what sorrow awaits the one who betrays him? The disciples began to ask each other which of them would ever do such a thing. So now, as we are looking at this, um, we have to realize that um, by now, the leaders had decided that it, they were going to make sure that Jesus was killed. 
they had just needed to try to figure out how. Let's look at Mark 11, 18. Now this is happening right after Jesus had cleared the temple when he entered into Jerusalem earlier in this same week. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. They did not want the people to react and begin to riot if they arrested him or took Jesus. Um, I want to now just take a moment and look at Mark 14, 1 and 2. It was now two days before Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, celebration they agreed, or the people may riot. So we know that these the leaders had been definitely planning on killing Jesus. Um, and then it would be Judas that would give him, uh, give them a way to do it where the crowds would not be reacting really strongly to them arresting Jesus. I would like to go back now in Luke and, um, you know, notice in verses 10 and 11 of 20, Luke 22, you know, Jesus had told the disciples, go and prepare the Passover meal. And they had asked him, you know, where? <laughs> so in verses 10 and 11, he, he replied, as soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? And one thing we have to realize there is that this would have been a pretty easy person for them to spot because it was the women's job to carry the water pitchers. So to see a man carrying a water pitcher would have been kind of unusual. So that tends to make him a little easier for the disciples to have spotted there as they entered in. So now they're going to begin this meal together. Jesus says that he's been eager to share that Passover meal with them because he knows that the suffering that he's going to be enduring is going to begin. And um, he told them, he said, I'm not going to be eating with you, eating this meal again, until he's fulfilled the meaning of it, the meaning of the Passover meal in the kingdom of God. I'm just going to read Luke 22, 16. This is Jesus. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That's directly, direct, exactly what he said. He knew that he would fulfill the true meaning of the Passover lamb. And then he begins something that we often think of as, as like the Lord's Supper, or it's often called communion. Um, in the Catholic Church, it's called the Eucharist. Um, he, first of all, had just given them some wine. But then, in verse 19, he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it in, then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, he took another cup of wine. And he said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. And then even, you know, even when we look into some of the other accounts of this Last Supper, he says, do this in remembrance of me. So here we have him offering them bread, which is representing his body, and offering them wine, which is representing his blood. Um, I want to go ahead and go to John 6, 53. Now, this was earlier. This was when Jesus was teaching. But I want to read this scripture. And... Um, talk a little bit about what this is meaning here. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. And then actually in verse 54, but anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise that person at the last day. And he goes on to talk about it a little bit more. And um, there, un this has to be understood spiritually. Um, this was pointing, even at that time, Jesus was pointing toward his death on the cross. And um, there's a little note here that I thought was really good. This is all in my, in I, my um, New Living Translation Bible. And we want to remember that the Eucharist here is referring to um, the Last Supper or the Communion, where we would, would eat the bread and drink the wine to remember Jesus. Although we need not see in this, the necessity of our partaking of the Eucharist in order to obtain salvation. 
it does teach the very vital importance of communion in strengthening our souls, bringing healing into our lives, and testifying to our faith. So going ahead and doing this that Jesus had asked us to do does really um, keep us remembering what he had done for us, and it's a true testimony of our faith. Let's also look right now um, back at Luke 22, 20. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. I, I want to go to Jeremiah, and we're going to go to Jeremiah 31, and we're going to read 31 through 33. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And um, this actually is quoted in its entirety in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, and Hebrews 10, 16 and 17. And the writer of Hebrews makes it abundantly clear that this prophecy in Jeremiah um, is a messianic prophecy, prophecy. It's about the coming of the Messiah. And it will be referring to those who are going to follow Jesus. And so this covenant that is being made, this new covenant, is the, the promise um, that God has established that in exchange for the blood of his son, we will give him our sin and our lives, and he will give us salvation. He will be the one to take the, the punishment, and we will be the recipients of the forgiveness and the grace. It is a, it is a covenant, a promise. And um, that was definitely prophesied that that would be coming. And as we look here, um, the, the blood, the representation of the blood means so much. Because that sacrifice, that blood that was shed by Jesus, is for our forgiveness. When we drink the, the wine or the juice in our case, um, when we drink that, we're remembering that we don't have to bear the punishment for our sin anymore. We can be forgiven, we can be clean. What an incredible thing that is. There is no sin that anyone has ever committed that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse and they can't be forgiven through him and in him. And so every time I've ever had the, the drink, um, when I've been taking communion, taking the Lord's Supper, that has just I felt it from the head to my toes because just to know that no matter what we've done, we can be forgiven, it's amazing. There was one time when I was at a special function that we were doing in a ministry, and instead of ha handing out kind of a little cup or just a sip of the juice, because um, we don't use the wine, um, they gave us a whole chilled can, like one of those cans about this size, of grape juice. And I just drank it down. And you could feel the coolness of that go all the way down. And just to drink that much of it gave me an overwhelming sense of how strong the blood of Jesus is in my life. For me to be forgiven. For all of us to be forgiven. But I also want to talk about him breaking the bread and him saying that this is my body which is given for you. And do this to remember me. When we think about the bread... I want to go to a very famous um, passage of Isaiah, which is clearly prophetic. We're going to go to Isaiah 53. And I want to read a good chunk of this um, because it is just so clearly talking about Jesus. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read from the beginning um, through at least verse 6. I highly recommend reading this entire section in here. Um, and 
I think even through yeah yeah highly recommend reading the entire chapter I'm not going to do that right now but all of Isaiah 53 it's so prophetic of Jesus who has believed our message to whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm my servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot like a root in dry ground there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance nothing to attract us to him uh, nothing to make him seem like oh he must be a king but he was despised and rejected a man of sorrows and acquainted with deepest grief we turned our backs on him and looked the other way he was despised and we did not care yet it was our weakness he carried it was our sorrows that weighed him down and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God a punishment for his own sins but he was pierced for our rebellion crushed for our sins he was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Wow, that just, it still can make me cry. He took our stuff. It wasn't his sin. It was ours. And this one little phrase in here, he was whipped so we could be healed. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Um, I was really putting some thought into that. Um, I want to go to 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25. This is what Peter said. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what's right. By his wounds, you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. And of course, we know that, that Peter was referencing back to the scripture in Isaiah. But he says, by his wounds, you are healed. I was... um had gone up right after the stroke um, at church. Uh, we had a time where people could go up, go up for prayer, for healing. And it was during the communion, during the Lord's Supper, that we did that. And I was waiting, and I, I remember I couldn't even stand because I was so shaky. I had, they brought me a chair up so I could sit up in front. And um, I remember I was just praying and um, thinking about how the Lord said that, you know, by His stripes, by His beating, you know, we are healed. And the Lord just kind of spoke to my heart and he said, you know, he said, I didn't have to be beaten for you to be able to be saved. The blood that was shed on the cross, my blood that was poured out when I was crucified, is for your salvation and your forgiveness. He said, I was beaten so you could be healed. And I just sat there and cried, you know, and I have really felt the incredible strength and healing of the Lord. I know that even just after that, that day when it was the pastor's wife who actually prayed for me, um, I started having um, some even greater progress in all the healing that I was trying to go through from the stroke. And then just recently, um, we were down at, at our son's church, and they were doing the Lord's Supper, doing the communion. and. Um, I'm pretty sure, now this is something that was just in my own heart. The Bible doesn't specifically say this, but I'm pretty sure that the only scars that Jesus has on him are on his hands and feet and in his side. Um, Thomas said, I need to put my hand into the scars on his hand and feel the scar on his side for me to believe this is Jesus. And Jesus said, here, Thomas, come. You can feel the scars. So I know that in his resurrected body, Jesus is bearing the scars of the wounds in his hands and feet when he was nailed to the cross. And this the, the, the spear that pierced his side where the blood and water flowed, where the blood was poured out. Um, from everything I can see as I look back over all the encounters that people had with Jesus after his resurrection, I don't really see any indication that he was terribly covered in horrific scars and we have to understand that would have been a real possibility when before Jesus was crucified 
um, he was bitten, beaten. He was beaten with uh, what they call a cat of nine tails. Um, it had little bits of bone and metal on the ends of it. It would have shredded his skin. It would have shredded his back. Um, it would have wrapped around and shredded the skin across his um, ribs and wrapped around him. Um, some of them may have gotten him in the face. And he was given a severe, severe beating. The flesh would have just been torn terribly. He had really huge thorns shoved into his head when they made the crown of thorns. The Bible says his, they pulled his beard out. Um, he would have been really, really messed up. Um, if you've ever seen somebody who has been severely beaten, um, in, even just in a movie or, or something, uh, it leaves very bad, bad scars. And um, so I, I don't know. It could very well be that, that, I mean, the Bible doesn't say that he didn't bear those scars. But in this resurrected body of his, in this immortal body, he's, he's shining and strong. And, and I know when we see him in Revelation, he's just absolutely just shining. And... Um, I just really feel like that in heaven, Jesus is the only one bearing scars, and those are in his hands and feet and in his side. And there have been people that have said they've even have, have died and been in heaven and then been, you know, brought back, um, resuscitated, who have mentioned the scars and, his, you know, that he had scars on him that way. So when I was sitting at my son's church, I was like, wow, Lord, I, um, I know you've got the scars from when you were crucified. If you don't have the scars from the beating, why? Why not? You know? And um, I really, once again, felt like he really spoke to me. And he said, um, your healing on this earth, any time that, that you're healed on this earth, it's temporary. When, when you come to be with me, and especially when you get your resurrected body, you will be completely healed. You won't need that healing anymore. It will, you will have an immortal, incorruptible body. And so that healing is temporary. The scars that show the cru my crucifixion, the outpouring of the blood, that is an eternal testimony to your eternal salvation and forgiveness. And once again, I just sat there and kind of cried because I thought, well, Lord, you went through that horrible beating just out of love for us, even for a healing that would just be temporary because our permanent healing is going to come when we're with him in eternity. But his body still shows the scars of our eternal salvation and the price that was paid so we could be forgiven. And like I said, I don't have a real, I can't just give you scripture right now to say that he was not bearing the scars from the whipping. But that what he I felt what I felt like he spoke to me really touched me a lot because when the time comes that I die and I go to be with him or if we go in the rapture and we immediately get our resurrected bodies any healing on earth is going to be only on earth in eternity will be completely healed wonderfully healed <laughs> that's so cool I, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about just one more thing now as we look in um Math in Luke, excuse me, 22, and we look at the last two verses um, here, the last three verses, um, 21 through 23, and talk a little bit about Judas once again. But here at the table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. For it has been determined that the Son of Man must die. But what sorrow awaits the one who betrays him? The disciples began to ask each other, which of them would ever do such a thing? And of course, we know that this is speaking about Judas. Now, what's really interesting to me is I've been able to discover that, as I really look at this, that even Jesus said that this had been prophesied. I want us to go ahead and look in Matthew. It's going to be chapter 26, and I want to read verses 23 and 24. It's the same account, but this is how it was spoken in Matthew. This is Jesus speaking. He replied, One of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it would be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Wow. So this was, was foretold 
This had been foretold long ago. Let's look at Psalm 41, 9. Even my best friend, the one I trusted completely, the one who shared my food, has turned against me. And that is, that is a, a prophecy about this, this time. Um, I want to look at John 13, 2. It was time for supper, and the devil had already, had already prompted Judas, son of Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And now I want to read 18 through 30. Jesus is speaking. I am not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but this fulfills the scripture that says, The one who eats my food is turned against me. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth, anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. That I am, by the way, was the I am <laughs> that God had spoken of way long ago. Verse 21, Now Jesus was deeply troubled, and he exclaimed, I will tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom it could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. That's always John. Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, Who is he talking about? So that the disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, It's the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, Hurry and go do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Jesus was their treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once going out into the night. And, you know, sharing, dipping uh, into the same place, sharing, you know, the, they would take pieces of bread and dip it into the food. That was a sign of a real true friendship. So Judas doing this with Jesus right before he betrayed him even makes it that much sadder that, that he would do that and then go right out and betray Jesus because that should have been something that showed real true friendship. Let's go ahead and look in Acts 1, 15 through 17. Now the disciples had returned from the Mount of Olives and they were meeting in an upper room of the house where they were staying. There was a large group gathered there. Um, I want us to notice what Peter has to say here. This is um, verses 15 through 17. During this time, when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. Brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit speaking through King David. Judas is one of us and shared in the ministry with us. And so David wrote that psalm. He wrote Psalm 41.9. And so um, I had not realized before I was really doing all this studying that Jesus had openly spoke that, that this betrayal had been prophesied, that it was going to happen. And, um, you know, Peter went on to say, yes, this had definitely fulfilled prophecy. Now, Judas doing this was prophesied that he would do it, but we got to realize that this man had absolutely made his own choices as he betrayed Jesus. So, when we go in and get going again next week in Luke 22, um, we'll be starting in then with verse 24, and going on then into the events that happen as Jesus is going to the Mount of Olives. Okay, let's pray. Lord, um, I, as I look back on Isaiah 53, I'm just overwhelmed with love for you. That you came just as a regular person. You didn't even look like you would be some big, incredible king and certainly didn't seem like you would be God. But Lord, you did that so that you could, could know our sorrows and so that you could lay your life down and shed that blood for our forgiveness. And Lord, that you would even in all of eternity bear those scars that showed that you gave your blood for all of us. That just st staggers me, Lord. It staggers me. I'm, I'm incredibly amazed by how much love you really have shown us. Lord, I pray that we will give you the respect that you have so deserved. And Lord, I pray that people will be drawn to you and drawn to your word 
and then once again that I get out of the way Lord please I only want your truth to come through I just want your your word to speak into our hearts and lives and I know Lord that you'll reveal truth to us and Lord I just pray that as there are so many that are feeling very confused and very lost in this world and Lord as there are so many that are sacrificing their lives now by not being willing to deny you oh God just bring your strength and Lord I, I pray that people can have clarity and that your light can just shine in and the air can blow fresh Lord in their lives with your truth and that Lord that that we will be willing to lay down anything and everything for your sake. Lord, when I think of how willing you have been to lay down everything for our sake, God, if we, oh, Jesus, if we could just love you back that much. Lord, I, I just ask it all in Jesus' name, and I love you. And please, Lord, be with the lonely and the needing and the hurting and bring your healing bring your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Thank you for joining with me today. I slushed my tea on my Bible, so I'm trusting it's going to dry. <laughs> well, it was for a good cause. <laughs> All right. Listen, I love you, and be blessed, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.